You know, usually in a story where the hero or heroes are down on their luck, it usually means something like in The Empire Strikes Back. The good guys have been hurt and the bad guys are winning for sure, but there's a clear message of hope for the future in some way. Whether it be a prophecy about the good guys unfolding, new allies being found, or any other number of things, something is going to go well for them in the near future. Things aren't looking good for the heroes, but things are definitely going to get better. What the heroes being down on their luck usually doesn't mean is them being forced to take on a job as bouncers in a shitty tavern in the poorest quarter of an industrializing city in between saving the world. But Gotrek and Felix aren't most heroes, and yet despite all that, I think they're the most enjoyable Warhammer characters to read about. I couldn't care less about the Emperor of Mankind, maybe or maybe not considering his sons to be nothing more than tools, but you can be damn sure I want to read about Gotrek and Felix murdering their 50th monster that week before Gotrek drinks himself to a coma and Felix finds the 50th woman that week to fall in love with. Anyways, we'll get to all that. So what's this video going to be about? Well, Gotrek and Felix, of course. But instead of going through their entire series, because that would take about 10 hours, I'm going to talk more about who they are and what you can expect out of them. Now, of course, there'll be spoilers, I'll just be honest with you, but I'll try and avoid anything major. For instance, I'm not going to bring up shit about any major motivations some characters might have, unless it's like Felix, where you find out their motivation about five seconds into the book. For example, why is Gotrick a slayer? We'll read the goddamn series and you'll find out. But I'm still going to talk about things that happen in the series, I mean, it's unavoidable. And I'll try to avoid anything about major character deaths, but, well, if nothing else, go and see what Gotrick's series is called in Age of Sigmar. You see what's missing? Yeah, I know. Yeah, it hurts, I know. And as one final note, I read 90% of these books back to back in the span of about four months because I bought them in those omnibuses where you get three main books and a few short stories. So if I say something happened in X story when it really happened in Y story, please forgive me. It all just kind of exists in this giant mush labeled Gotrick, Felix, and Snorri in my brain. But we'll get to him later as well. Anyways, let's start with the dwarf, the myth, the legend himself, Gotrick Garnison. Might as well start with his job. Gotrick is a slayer. A slayer in Warhammer Fantasy is a dwarf who done goofed real bad and now has a die in glorious battle to redeem himself. Sometimes a dwarf takes a slayer oath for something truly dishonorable, like neglecting your military duties leading to the downfall of a whole lot of dwarfs. Other times it's because Olaf Aelbeard lost a month's income of gold coins gambling and the only option left to him is clearly suicide by monster. To avoid spoilers, I'm not going to tell you why Gotrick took the slayer oath, but either way, he done goofed and is now a slayer. There's a big problem here though. Gotrick's kind of the worst slayer alive because he sucks at dying. Every time he gets in a fight with something, it gets brutally murdered. Humans, dark elves, beastmen, greater demons, doesn't matter in the least. If you try to fight Gotrick one-on-one, -on -one, you're gonna die a messy death. Hell, outnumbering him just means more of you are gonna die. In the last Gotrick and Felix book, just called Slayer, Felix refers to Gotrick taking on a Chaos Lord and his warband as nature taking its course. Gotrick naturally hates this. He's not actively suicidal, at least no more than anyone else who's actively seeking out death in combat, but the series takes place over the course of roughly 20 years, and Gotrick was a Slayer for longer than that. That's several decades of just not being able to die despite all aspects of your culture and religion saying, time to die now, champ. This is both because of a magical axe keeping him alive and giving him strength, which every time someone observes it, they say it courses with divine energy, so you can't say I'm spoiling that because it's brought up every five goddamn minutes, and because either way, he's just that much of a stubborn bastard. It drives him to take on more and more dangerous quests, which is oftentimes the driving force behind the plot of the Gotrick and Felix books. But despite his despair at being alive, he's got a good heart deep down, so he always goes on another adventure to help and maybe finally get himself killed. Though keep in mind, when I say Gotrick's a good person, deep down, I mean deep down. Usually when a character is called a jerk with a heart of gold or something like that, they're like a Marvel movie character where they're basically a saint but they say sarcastic things every now and then. If Felix isn't holding him back, Gotrick will happily kill a man just for spilling his beer, and on one occasion almost murdered a ship full of high elves because one of them refused to step aside when Gotrick had to use the bathroom. He does have a soft spot for kids though and usually won't abandon a horde of refugees to their fate at least. So yeah, very deep down he's a good person. Like, Minds of Moria Deep, but, you know, it's still there. Until the AOS books, we rarely get the full extent of Gotrick's thoughts, and I haven't gotten to reading those yet because I'm still reading the last of the fantasy series at a rate of one page per month because I don't want to run out of Gotrick and Felix, but I digress. Much of the time, Gotrick appears to be nothing more than a brutal killing machine who enjoys battle for its own sake as much as it offers a chance at redemption. When the books get combat heavy, it's almost like he stops being a character in his own right and more like a force of nature. And indeed, there will be times in the series where Felix has to plan around Gotrick's bloodlust as the main obstacle in his path. He's not an idiot though, don't get me wrong. In fact, there's a very good scene where he uses a trap and ambushes to take down a whole lot of enemies in one of the short stories. And when another slayer questions why he doesn't just jump in their head first, he says that Grimner expects them to die doing their very best, so why wouldn't he use his head every now and then? Even with all of that though, because the fact we see the series through Felix's eyes, we see just how confusing an alien Gotrick can be to a human. In fact, the Gotrick and Felix novels in general are really great at hammering home that in Warhammer, the dwarfs truly do have a culture that's almost alien to humanity. Gotrick usually being the prime 
example of this, but there are plenty of other dwarfs that feature in the series. They're not just shorter and greedier people that eat rocks for nourishment, things they consider to be normal are absolutely insane to humans and vice versa. Due to that, much of the time you might think, wow, Godric sure is a shitbag, why is he doing that? And you know what? He is a shitbag. Because every now and then you'll get even other dwarfs telling them he needs to cool it with the attitude. But every now and then, he'll do something that makes you realize that he still has things he wants in life other than death by big scary thing. That he does in fact care about a very, very small selection of people in the world. Chief among that number being, of course, his co-star Felix Jaeger, or Harry Jaeger as you'll often hear him referred to as. Especially if you play Total War where he screams his name out every time you click on him. Felix is the son of a burgeoning empire merchantman who runs a very successful business doing something, I'm pretty sure in the end times they were shipping lumber around. Realistically though, I'm pretty sure his father would sell orphan slaves if he thought it would turn a profit. Either way, Felix and his brother were supposed to take over the family business so the Jaeger family could finally become the nobles they deserved to be. Then Felix decided that he wanted to be a poet, which pissed his family off, went to college to do just that, and accidentally killed someone in a duel over whether or not violent protest was an acceptable form of protest. What a suddenly relevant backstory, I gotta say. As I'm writing this, I'm realizing that the comment section is gonna look like a goddamn 4chan thread. Mm. Anyways, to move on as quickly as I can, he was expelled for, you know, murdering someone, accident or not, and then was a key figure in something called the Window Tax Riots. A very revolutionary war-y kind of backstory. I like it. During these riots, Felix was almost run down by six of the Reichsguard, Karl Franz's finest, whereupon Gotrick saved him by murdering six of the Reichsguard, Karl Franz's finest. You'll find that's a running theme whenever Felix is really in danger. Because like I said earlier, anything that gets close to Gotrick dies a horrible, horrible death. They both got blackout drunk, Felix to drown out the trauma, and Gotrick because why not? Felix swore an oath to be Gotrick's rememberer and record his death for posterity because Gotrick has a very subtle but noticeable ego. And the moment he woke up with his hangover, he realized that dwarfs take their oaths very seriously and he was now Gotrick's whipping bitch. It was actually pretty funny early on because at first he thought about casually telling Gotrick he wasn't going to stick with them for all this. Then some tragic things happened to Felix and some others and he also saw how Gotrick was a living tornado of knife crime and thought better of it. Now since Felix is the one whose point of view we most often get and Gotrick is his much more competent companion, it might be easy to say that Gotrick is the jurgen to Felix's Caiaphas Cain. Which I guess isn't the worst way to get a 40k fan to read these novels, but I don't think it's entirely correct either. Their characters are very different, and to be honest, the only things that they really have in common are that there's two of them and one of them is a little bit more competent in a fight than the other. Unlike Cain, Felix ultimately has no real reason to keep being heroic. In fact, there's a few times where he has a chance to get away from Godric and leave his oath behind, and he chooses not to for one reason or the other. Sure, each of them sometimes get in a situation where fighting now is the best chance to not die later, but in Felix's case, there's just as many times where he chooses to fight of his own volition. Also, unlike Cain, Felix doesn't really have a reputation to worry about. There's no case where he'll lose the respect of those under him if he doesn't actively fight. Oftentimes, he chooses to fight alongside Gotrick for no other reason than he thinks it's the right thing to do, and on occasions, there's a few times where he's just as ready to kill as Gotrick is. He's also not a coward. At first reading the series, you might think I'm crazy for saying that, but hear me out. Initially, Felix is just some college kid in over his head. He learned fencing at school, but that's all he has for combat experience. So even fighting against a single goblin at first is a worrying thing because it's real life or death combat. He's not instantly a video game protagonist. He has to learn his skills and adapt, which makes the books honestly so much better to read. You can see him transition from someone who barely knows what he's doing to being Zoro from One Piece. Feels very relatable. You know what, Felix? I too would be shitting my pants profusely at this moment, only in my case, it would probably be literal. The other reason he sometimes comes across as weak is that Gotrick is incredibly overpowered and the enemies he fights are a few leagues beyond anyone who isn't Gotrick. Have you ever played a D&D campaign where one person was incredibly overpowered, so the DM had to throw increasing strong enemies at the party create a meaningful sense of threat, but that also meant that everyone who wasn't the overpowered asshole was just getting their shit rocked. That's what the daily life of Felix Jaeger is like. Tangent incoming, but I would also like to give you a piece of knowledge about that kind of player. If they bring up how their character isn't really that overpowered before anyone even says anything remotely about that topic, they're an asshole. Because they're thinking about how people are gonna say they're overpowered, which means they're very aware of the fact they're overpowered and gonna ruin it for other people. And if you found yourself doing that exact thing, I'd just like to say, Fuck you. You're the reason everyone else is looking at their phone during a party fight. I know some of you are listening to me right now who've done that. You know who you are. At least one of the friends I've played with who's certainly listening to this at some point admits he makes overpowered builds, which at least he admits it. When you admit something like that, it takes away 90% of the anger. Unlike our other friend who makes overpowered builds of OP classes he found on the Homebrew D&D website and then claims that 3, 4, D, 10, dice plus 8 worth of damage attacks a turn with a 12 plus to hit modifier isn't broken because he has a charisma stat of 9 to balance out all the other ones being 17 or 
or higher. But I'm wildly digressing by this point, so let's get back to the angry dwarf and Warhammer Fantasy's most unlucky man. Back to comparing him to Kane, Felix is also much more honest. Caiaphas Kane plays down his achievements, both because he thinks he's just a coward and because he knows that's what the sort of character he pretends to be would do. Felix, meanwhile, actually is that sort of modest hero. He genuinely doesn't think he's doing all that much special and even says the classic, I'm just doing what anyone would do in my position line. One time he briefly wields a hammer that due to magic only a dwarfish hero should be able to wield and he tosses it like Thor to Bloodthirster and cold clocks him with it. It's what allows Gotrick to kill that Bloodthirster because otherwise the demon was going to kill him and end the book series about a dozen early. And at the end of the book, all he learned from the experience was that his hand hurts from holding the lightning hammer and for some reason the dwarfs are all looking at him like some sort of mythical figure which just makes him vaguely uncomfortable. And every now and then we get a point of view of someone facing them and usually goes something along the lines of, holy crap this dwarf is a monster, screw that, I'm going to go fight this scrawny blonde next to him and oh hey what's this sword poking out of my chest doing there? It's like Godric is Goku and Felix is Krillin. Everyone always forgets that Krillin could blow up a planet too if he felt like it when standing next to Goku, but imagine trying to mug Krillin on the street. Say goodbye to your kneecaps, chucklehead. And honestly, Gotrick and Felix compliment each other as characters a lot more than Caiaphas and Jurgen do. Jurgen, as badass as he is, don't get me wrong, is almost just a plot device. Kane will be in trouble from Tyranids, but thankfully because Jurgen is both a blank and the man with the foulest body odor in the galaxy, the hive mind was disrupted long enough for Kane to pull it a win. He enables Kane to do his thing, and that's kind of it. Meanwhile, Gotrick and Felix both do things on their own. There's times they're separated from one another, and it actually feels like both of them are missing something vital, rather than, oh, Felix doesn't have Gotrick around? How will he handle not having his get-out-of-jail-free card? Despite this, they're each completely valid characters in their own right, who could do well with their own series, and indeed, Gotrick now has. Though, of course, they still work best when they're together. Together, they wander the old world looking for things to kill Gotrick, and also the rest of the world, because they've ended up pretty much everywhere. They fought alongside and against Tomb Kings, they fought plenty of orcs, they fought ogres in the Mountains of Morn. Hell, they helped fight a revolution in Araby, which I'm pretty sure accounts for like 80% of all Araby lore. Wherever they go, you can be assured of three things. Gotrick is going to fail to die, and it said kill whatever he hoped would do him in. Felix is going to fall in love with a woman to some extent. And whatever amount of money the two make is going to disappear by the next book. Turns out it's a good thing Felix never joined the family business, because he would have killed it before anything managed to get to Gotrick. At one point, they were involved with one of Nagash's magical artifacts, which scared the ever-loving shit out of the wizard investigating it when he realized just what he was holding. They fought Kemler and Krell, they fought a dragon ogre. Really, if there's more than one of something in the Warhammer world, Gotrick and Felix have almost certainly fought and killed one of them. They even had an adventure with Teclas once. Yes, that Teclas. And he was afraid of Gotrick. For reference, Teclas can nuke entire armies at once if he's so inclined. And this angry midget scared him. The only reason Gotrick didn't brain him was because Felix needed assistance only Teclas could provide at the time. Imagine how the end times would have turned out if that happened. Probably for the better, honestly. It's also really funny how in the epilogue of the book, Teclas wakes up alone and finds out that Gotrick left him and drags Felix along with him. And he wakes up alone in a ruin that's surrounded by orcs and chaos followers and is just like, thanks guys, really appreciate that one. Funnily enough though, despite the fact they keep wandering into situations that would make them heroes in any other story, for one reason or other, they never go beyond the realm of first level D&D characters in terms of their living conditions and status. One reason is that they're still technically wanted criminals in the Empire. I mean, Felix started a massive tax riot and Godric murdered six of the Emperor's personal guard. They're not exactly welcome back in Altdorf, and until the end times, Felix never really shakes the fear that someone's gonna recognize them. So if only for that reason, they often lay low when they're in the Empire. Another reason is that Godric, being a slayer, doesn't really give a Skaven's ass about accumulating wealth and building a life for himself. He's trying to end his own after all, so when all is said and done, he sits down for a single heroic feast to enjoy some food and ale, and then says, alright manling, time to wander around the Empire some more and hope we trip over another beastman herd. The inciting instances of all this stuff are pretty different enough that they're not just copy and paste between books, but there's two common themes. One is that someone wants them to do something, Gotrick says no, and Felix says that surely wherever they'd be going would have a mighty doom waiting for him, so they end up going. The other is that someone promises Gotrick a mighty doom if they do something and Felix gets roped into it because of his oath. And then they go have some crazy adventures, usually meeting some genuinely interesting side characters who... They're side characters in a Warhammer novel. Let's just say they have a limited shelf life. Despite the series being called Gotrick and Felix, Felix is certainly more the main character than Gotrick. It's almost always in his point of view, in third person granted, but still, so we see all these events happening through his eyes. Over the course of the series, you can see how they develop as comrade-at-arms, and sometimes if you squint, you can almost call them friends. And you also see Felix get the shit kicked out of him. Like, a lot. But beyond the two main ones, there's four more characters I'd really like to cover, because I love all of them. I'm gonna go in ascending order of how much I like the characters, but really 
Hopefully they're all great addition to the series. First off is Orica Magdava Stragov, who bears the honor of having the single most Slavic name in all of Warhammer outside of the Australian Firstborn characters. She even has her own trilogy of books, a trilogy I highly recommend you don't Google search if you don't want massive spoilers for Godric and Felix. In fact, just don't look her up until you get about halfway through all of the Godric and Felix books. Pretend she doesn't exist, except for right now because I need my average watch time to stay up. I also couldn't find any artwork of her that wasn't either a massive spoiler or a softcore porn, so I hope you enjoy this old model she got a while ago because that's all you're gonna be seeing for the next minute. Anyways, Ulrika is the daughter of a Kislevite minor noble. She's good at horse riding, swordsmanship, or I guess swordswomanship, and is one of the women of the series Felix fell hardest for. She's also one of the women of the series Felix was hardest for. She's on and off between being a main and a side character, and I will say no more to avoid spoiling. Sometimes she disappears, which, fair enough, she wants to be your own protagonist too. She deserves it, I say. Sometimes she's a bit of a bitch, other times she's a wonder to have on the page and add some character that no one else does to the series. At the very least, she's a nice distraction from his usual company of suicidal dwarfs. Good character. Felix is down bad for her. That's all I gotta say on her. Needs more Rule 34. Next up is Max Schreiber, a light wizard who, alongside Gotrick, is the other character who makes regular appearances that's overpowered as balls. At one point, he says, I am neither techless nor Nagash, and he's right. He's still overpowered as hell, though. Apparently, light magicians can heal you. Did you know that? Because Max can cure your black death right up. Even if it's caused by having tiny demons in your body, doesn't matter. He'll fix it right up. He can also blast several dozen enemies at once with magical light, send his consciousness away from his body like he's no clipping out of it, and make protective wards that completely immunize people to chaos until their battery runs out. So yeah, he's a pretty strong wizard. He's also introduced around the same time as Ulrika, and he and Felix spend the next couple of books in a dick measuring contest over who gets to be with her. It kind of wavers back and forth between who's winning the battle for the Ulrik Hussy. As a side note, my father is reading Gotrick and Felix because I lent him the first book, and I'm incredibly excited for when he stumbles across this video and hears his son say the word Ulrik Cussy. That aside, Max is incredibly wise and smart, and a smartass, but not in the usual Marvel way where he's a quip or comment every other sentence. Every now and then he'll just say something dry and vaguely mocking that usually starts another measuring contest with Felix before a chaos invasion interrupts them. Max's role in the story is oftentimes to justify how the gang can cut through an entire horde of enemies, but also not just one-shot the main bad guy. He takes care of the minions, but it tires them out because magic and warhammers like handling unstable nuclear material, so Godric and Felix swoop in at the end to save the day. Again, though, he's still a badass, make no mistake. He's like the tier of mage right below Teclas and Nagash, which still means that if he was in Total Warhammer, he'd be a legendary lord or hero. Almost nothing can stand up to him, and it's really fun to read the interactions between him and Felix as they waver back and forth between good friends and two parts of a love triangle. Next up is the second to the last one I'd like to mention, Malachi McIson. He's a dwarf slayer, which is a running theme with the recurring dwarf characters you might notice. Unlike most other slayers, though, he tries to fulfill his death oath by creating the most outlandish inventions possible and taking them to battle. What sort of inventions, Pancreas? I'm glad you asked, viewer. He made a repeating crossbow. I believe he invented parachutes, so that's pretty helpful for gyrocopter pilots. Might not sound like the most interesting invention, that last one, but if you try and test a parachute and it doesn't work, you're gonna meet Doom pretty damn quickly. Oh, and he built the Hindenburg, and then covered it in armored plating. The one in the books apparently isn't even the first one he built, but he called the previous one something like the Unbreakable or whatever, so I don't think I even need to elaborate on what happened to that one. He's incredibly cheerful, not only for a dwarf, but especially a slayer, and he's a mad genius. I wouldn't say that he's super funny, but it's just so exciting to read when he's on the page. He makes everything just seem like a high fantasy adventure novel, which is a nice breath of fresh air before it goes back to being Warhammer and all grim, dark, and depressing again. At one point, he gets blasted by magic and just stands there and takes it like the Senator Armstrong meme. He even says something along the lines of, your magic can't hurt a dwarf, which is somewhat close to both Nanomachine Sun and You Can't Hurt Me Jack, so now I'm going to accuse Metal Gear Rising of ripping off Warhammer fantasy. On a final note about him, I highly recommend having your phone nearby when you're reading books that he features in, because they gave him a Scottish accent, and it is goddamn illegible. Now, I don't think a Scottish accent is actually that hard to understand verbally. I mean, I understand it, but reading that shit? Yeah, good luck, bud. He's the first character in a book I've ever had to stop reading because I had to look up what in the hell anything he was saying meant, and I wouldn't have him any other way. Rock on, McIson. Here's to seeing you as a legendary lord in immortal empires. Finally, the best slayer and best dwarf ever, Snorri Nosebiter. Now, Snorri is an interesting dwarf. Initially, his role is purely comic relief with a smidgen of body horror. All slayers dyed their hair red and shape it into a crest. Snorri, on the other hand, shaved his head bald and jammed three nails into his skull he painted red. 
Jesus Christ, dude. Him and Gotrek actually knew each other long before each of them became a slayer, and he's one of the few people that Gotrek counts as one of his friends, even if he won't admit it. He also refers to himself in the third person whenever he speaks, and generally talks like someone who has dropped down the path up to the mountain a few too many times. But he's so relentlessly cheerful and fun that even in the darkest of hours he can bring a smile to everyone's face, from Felix to Ulrika and Max and anyone else around them. As much as they might get exasperated by his sheer stupidity, it just wouldn't be the same without Snorri around. He also hits like a bus. If Gotrek is Goku, then Snorri is Vegeta. He's never really allowed to win the final big battle, but a lot of the time he looks even cooler than Gotrek and will still be instrumental in victory. When he's not fighting, him and Gotrek like to get into headbutting contests. This is where they get really drunk and headbutt each other until someone passes out. That's probably a good indication of his main role in these books. He brings some comedy to the stories while still being badass enough to keep up with the two leads. His second main role is to make you incredibly depressed whenever we get any amount of time in Snorri's point of view. I mean, it makes his character a lot better for it than if he was just happy, strong idiot, but the first time I was reading a book from Snorri's point of view, my exact reactions were, ah, hell yeah, it's about Snorri now, followed by, I'm gonna go lie down and blankly stare at the ceiling for a few hours now in the span of about five seconds. And I really want to talk about the second to last book in the series because it's got a really good moment between Godric and Snorri, but I don't want to spoil it. I also don't want to spend the rest of this video weeping into my microphone, so let's move on past this now, please. Snorri is either gonna bring a smile to your face and get a laugh out of you when he shows up, or crush your hearts into tiny pieces. There's no in-between. Best dwarf, best slayer, Someone please give him a model, put him in Total Warhammer, please for the love of god give me more Snorri Nosebiter, something needs to fill that hole in my heart. And even beyond what you can call the main cast, there's a ton of really cool side characters that are only in one book each. For example, in Elf Slayer, there's this high elf who has this really defining character moment that without spoiling because it'll ruin the story, even the most diehard elf hater would salute him for what he's doing. And I'm not just saying that as an elf simp, trust me, what this elf does is goddamn heroic. So instead, let's just share a couple of cool stories about what Gotcha and Felix have done and- Wait, 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 wait. I forgot about Thanquil. Thanquil is a Skaven Grey Seer who can best be described as living proof that you can fail upwards. He's gonna get his own video, both because I can give him a mini do or don't like Nagash and because he's just so fun to talk about. But simply, he's the Skaveniest Skaven who ever Skavened, and he features fairly frequently in the early Gotrek and Felix books. On the one hand, he's a hell of a mage who snorts Warpstone on the regular to boost his strength. On the other hand, he's a goddamn moron who sabotages his own plans because he thinks it'll give him more power over the other Skaven. Case in point, there's three books in the series about the Skaven trying to take over Gnome. At least I think it's three, but I read them over the course of like three weeks, so it could be two or four, but I think it's three. And while Thanquil is working with the other Skaven characters in that book, he writes Gotrek and Felix letters pretending to be a human informant about the Skaven. If you ever have a chance, please just read them online. You can find at least one of them on TV Tropes if you just search up Thanquil's letters to Gotrek and Felix. They, of course, immediately figure out that it's clearly a Skaven doing this and are a little bit concerned why one of them is helping, but they figure, eh, fuck it, and help Thanquil ruin the plans of Thanquil's allies. Which will supposedly help Thanquil become more powerful, but in practice he just keeps weakening his own forces. What a silly guy. He shows up more often, and every single time he does, the books get even better, and about ten times as funny as they were before. Okay, now I'm gonna tell you some anecdotes about Gotrek and Felix. Be warned, this will be the heaviest bit on the spoilers, because I'm just gonna be talking about the stories. So if you still want to be spoiler-free, then skip to the next part of the video. Aren't chapters a great feature? Anyways, how about the Tomb Queen that was relentlessly thirsty for Felix. You heard me. Gotrek and Felix end up in Lamy and fight some vampires as part of the greater story. The B plot is the vampire's point of view and what she's doing, but it also feels kind of like the C plot of the book is how badly this mummy woman wants Felix's meat. I'm not kidding, there are so many times where she makes some comment along the lines of, if I still had skin, you would be my husband or some shit. She's also such a badass on her own that Gotrek outright says if she wasn't undead, he'd marry the two of them and Felix would have no input on the matter. That's high praise from any dwarf about the undead, let alone the fact that Gotrek dislikes damn near everyone whose name is in Snorri or Felix. Tragically, there's no shipping it because she is again a mummy, but goddamn do I get it. And while I'll leave you all to figure out if I understand Gotrek's view on the matter of the Tomb Queens, how about the time Gotrek and Felix met their body doubles? They went to this dwarf hole that was basically auctioning off their hold's treasure in exchange for help retaking it, since at the time of the novel what they actually controlled of the hold was basically the outside door and a tavern they built around it to attract customers. Very undwarf-like, would certainly get an entry in the book, and Gotrek makes sure to call everyone involved a massive pussy. But there's violence to be had, so Gotrek still goes in, and they meet who else but another dwarf slayer with a rememberer to immortalize his own death. Felix and the other human commiserate over their suicidal companions, and Gotrek is slightly nicer to the slayer because they're pretty much the only group of people on the planet the bastard can relate to. Then they keep suspiciously wandering into death traps over and over and over until they find out that, wait a minute, the other dwarf's rememberer was trying to get his slayer killed to be free of his own ult. Gotrek and Felix were both unfortunate enough to be in the way, and some asshole mercenary was gonna pay the rememberer big time to kill him. Considering that it's a short story and not a proper book this takes place 
Jason, you can probably guess how this ends up for everyone involved that isn't Gotrick or Felix. And for one last story, and this is a big one, how about how Gotrick ended up in the Mortal Realms? Now this is incredibly spoiler heavy because it's all about the last Gotrick and Felix book, which again I have not finished, but my eternal hatred towards myself means I looked it up like a goddamn clown because I couldn't help myself at first and now I'm forcing it onto all of you as a way of consoling myself. If nothing else, we both know we made it into Age of Sigmar, so there's only so much in the way of true spoilers to be had, I guess. Anyways though, Gotrick and Felix found out that surprise, the dwarf god Grimnir was grooming Gotrick. No, not like a Discord mod, but to become Grimnir Dos Boino. And then also, by the way, they need to stop Bellicor from ascending to Godhood if they could, please and thank you. Oh, and also there's one greater demon of each chaos god present, including a bloodthirster that has some personal history with the two. If you remember way back to the start of this rambling video, it's the one Felix threw knockoff Mjolnir at. He remembers that inconvenience they caused him, and he's ready to take revenge. Unfortunately for the demons, Gotrick is able to stop Bellicor with help from Felix. He does this by slapping the shit out of Bellicor with the bloodthirster. God, so cool. And then he takes Grimnir's place in holding back the tides of the warp, which because it's the end times is naturally changed to getting lost in the warp while chaos overtakes the world anyways. Of course, how did Gotrick survive all of this? Even the gods of the old world died, how did he survive? Have you been missing everything I've said so far? He's Gotrick freaking Garnison. You can't kill Gotrick. So Gotrick started killing demons. And more demons. And then, more demons. He killed demons for so long that eventually he stumbled his way into Age of Sigmar. But you know what the thing about that is? At a certain point, he stopped fighting demons because they just kept leaving him alone. He says they were probably bored of fighting him. Realistically, the Chaos Gods were shitting their pants at the man with the demon-killing axe wandering around their house, murdering everything they sent at him. And thus do we get to the end of Gotrick and Felix. For now, anyways. Gotrick figured out that a lot of the Stormcast Eternals in the Mortal Realms were once heroes from the Old World, after all. And even if Felix isn't one of them, he's not resting until he finds his best friend and his axe. As for Gotrick's rules, I thought about doing a do or don't mini thing here, but I don't really have much to say. He's expensive as all hell and slow, but he's almost impossible to kill, and anything that enters melee range with him just isn't coming out. Kite him and fire every single ranged attack you have at him, otherwise you're just gonna lose the match. If you're playing Gotrick, just send him on in to the biggest blob of enemies you can find or the biggest scariest looking monster. Who knows, maybe you'll find the one person that plays AOS that hasn't heard of Gotrick. Then you can enjoy wiping the smug look off your opponent's face when your lone dwarf wipes out their Death Star Model. And that is the end of this glorified slideshow on the legendary Gotra Gerdeson and Felix Jaeger, the single best Warhammer characters ever written, aside from, of course, their friend Snorri. Tune in next time for, I don't know, a video about another Warhammer fantasy character or something. Or a phone company. Thank you, of course, to my wonderful channel members. You are like Godric to my Felix, letting me survive another day in the horrid world we live in. Don't, don't think about that analogy too much. If you'd like to support the channel, consider subscribing or becoming a member. Either way, thanks for watching and take care out there. No one joke, I'm just gonna tell you all straight up, Gotcha can take on any Primarch as of AOS. Hell, towards the end times, he probably could have done it already, but as of AOS, he for sure can. Like, there's not a shred of doubt in my mind. If Horus and Gotrick walked into a room and fought to the death, the one walking out is gonna be the angry dwarf complaining about how shoddy even the human demigods are.